Okay. So this is the third in the rheology lectures. Um, you heard last week from Phil Skema, who gave an introduction on rheology and rock deformation, and then Uli Fowl gave a talk yesterday about rheology and focused a lot on um, deformation more in the diffusion regime and how that relates to seismic attenuation. Um, and so I'm going to talk today about um, rheology, uh, looking at um, how we relate measurements of seismic anisotropy to what we see in mantle samples and what the relationship is between this um, seismic measurement that we can make and what is going on at the microstructural level. So this is again focusing on rheology in the ductile regime. So compared to what we saw in the previous talk this morning, I'm shifting us back down deeper into the subduction zone system into the area where things are flowing by a ductile mechanism. Um, there is certainly a lot related to rheology um, that was uh, discussed a little bit this morning in terms of the rheology at that plate zone interface, but what we're going to focus on um, now is what's going on in mantle flow in a subduction zone setting and what the constraints are from field samples in how we interpret um, the seismic observations that we have. So this is a photomicrograph of a prototype. This was actually collected from the Tonga Trench um, from a depth of about eight kilometers. Um, it is an unusually fresh seafloor sample. Uh, you guys saw in the um, tutorial, the geology tutorial last week, you saw some of these samples um, that we have from the Tonga Trench. These are um, one of the few places where we have for our samples really collected in situ. Um, but what I want to focus on in these samples today is um, largely the olivine, which is most of what you're seeing in this image. There is a little bit of orthopyroxene in this sample, and there are trace amounts of spinel that are not visible in this image. Um, olivine here, you will see this gradation in the colors. That is an indication of subgrain boundaries. That is an indication of the deformation that has gone on in the sample. So when we are talking about flow in the mantle, we are looking at samples like these that are relatively coarse-grained, but they do have a lattice alignment, and this is something that we can measure and we can link to the seismic properties. So I'm going to start out and give you an overview of why we care about this in the subduction zone setting, and then I will um, go into detail about how we look at these samples and how we relate those samples to the seismic properties. Um, so this is an olivine crystal with its, it's an orthorhombic crystal, um, and it has three principal axes uh, referred to as the A, B, and C axis, or also the 100, 010, and 001 axis. And I will use both terminologies in this talk, raise your hand, um, and ask me questions if it's not clear what I'm talking about as I go along. Um, the key thing to take away from this image is that the A axis in olivine is the seismically fast direction, and the B axis is the seismically slowest direction, and the C axis is intermediate. Um, so this is, in terms of uh, understanding seismic un anisotropy, this is the, um, the, the key aspect that you have an anisotropic mineral um, and that the seismic uh, waves will propagate at different speeds depending on which direction it goes through the mineral. The other important thing is that during flow in the mantle, if you're flowing by a dislocation mechanism, then you will end up having a crystallographic preferred orientation, also referred to as a lattice preferred orientation. That um, indicates that you have slip on a specific slip system um, in olivine. So in this case, what I'm showing here is what we call often the A-type slip system, um, also called easy slip for olivine. Um, and another way to talk about it is actually identifying what that slip system is. So this terminology, 100 with the square brackets, indicates the slip direction. So it is slipping in the 100 direction or the A-axis direction. And then the 010 indicates the slip plane. So the plane that it is slipping on, outlined in red, is the 010 plane. And the way that we figure this out in looking at natural samples is looking at the pole figure, which is plotted at the bottom here. Um, so this is an olivine pole figure showing this easy slip system. The maximum, so this is just a schematic, so this is showing a maximum approximately aligned up with the shear direction, so that is the slip direction. And this that is normal to that shear direction is the slip plane. And then the 01, the 001 plane or the C-axis is not um, dominant in the slip system. So this is the fact that um, when olivine is deforming by a dislocation mechanism, it results in an alignment um, because it is dominantly slipping on a slip system such as this one is what is giving rise to seismic anisotropy in the mantle. <laughs> 
Um, and so we have this general model for the upper mantle that in the asthenosphere we have flow that is reflecting the current plate motion, and that will um, result in an alignment of the olivine A axis because that is usually the slip direction, um, and that is also the fastest um, seismically fastest axis. Um, and then as you go to shallower depths in the mantle, we expect to get fabrics that are frozen in. And so this is the general schema, the general conceptual framework that we work on when we're interpreting the fabrics um, in olivine-rich rocks. Um, and then this can be related to seismic anisotropy. And I am uh, benefiting now from the fact that Ed Garnero uh, posts a lot of images on his website, inclu including this nice little GIF showing what happens if you have an incoming seismic wave that is, um, goes through an anisotropic medium, so your collection of olivine crystals, as long as they have a relative crystallographic alignment, that is an anisotropic medium, and that will result in this shear wave splitting that he is showing here. So the end result of that is that you get um, this delta T, which is something that the seismologists can measure and tell us a lot about in terms of what the splitting is, the magnitude, the direction. Um, and so this has been, uh, this was hypothesized going back to the 60s that there should be seismic anisotropy. And um, there was a very nice experiment done on the East Pacific rise in the, uh, in the 1990s. So this is one example of the, of the results from this experiment. This is the ridge axis coming down here, the East Pacific rise. So we are way out uh, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean with the Pacific and Nazca plates spreading apart from each other. Um, and these are the shear wave splitting measurements that were made by Wolf and Solomon. And you can see that they are lined up approximately perpendicular to the axis. And so that agrees with this model that the olivine A axis, the seismically fastest axis, um, records the direction of mantle flow. And because flow at a ridge to be um, going perpendicular to the ridge axis, um, seeing that this shear wave splitting, that the alignment was like this, was a nice corroboration of this model. So you've all had coffee. Pop quiz. At a subduction zone, an example being here the Tonga subduction zone, where you have two plates converging, what would you expect to be the orientation of your um, seismically fast axis of the shear wave splitting? Do you expect it to be parallel to the subduction zone or perpendicular to the subduction zone? So raise your hand if you would expect it to be parallel to the subduction zone. So if you would expect it to be either parallel, so this is the direction of plate convergence, and if you would expect it to be parallel or perpendicular. And let's just stick with the mantle wedge for now. I'm just, so I'm just saying theoretically, what would you right. predict? At what point? At, if you were looking at the splitting here over the mantle wedge. Or I mean, you could also say over here as well in this case. I mean, as a, as a general, what, direct, what orientation? Just raise your hand if you think it would be parallel to the subduction zone. If both your plates are moving, converging. OK, and then if you think it would be perpendicular to the subduction zone. So the, the expectation, the plate motion is going towards each other is that it would be, the answer would be B. Right, and as many of, you, many of you in the room know, what the actual observation is, is that it is um, that we see this um, trench parallel um, direction. So this is the observation. This is the Tonga Trench over here. This is a figure um, from Smith et al. 2001, uh, which Doug is a co-author on, so you can ask him questions about it. Uh, but the, the main observation I want to highlight is this trench parallel splitting that was observed. And in this case, this is on the, size, uh, this is on the mantle wedge side. But um, the observations have also been made on the opposite side, and they are also non-intuitive. So this is now non-intuitive? Count, sorry, counterintuitive. So OK, this is now the compilation from Maureen Long and Torsten Becker's paper in 2010, um, summarizing all of the observations that have been made. And again, here is Tonga down here. And this is this really nice example where on both sides of the trench, you have this um, trench parallel splitting, which is not what we ex would expect uh, based on the fact that we expect the olivine A axis to be the slip direction and to that, that to be more or less li lined up with the plate motion direction. Jesse, you were probably going to say that, but I think it's a fair statement that it's not necessarily everywhere trench parallel either. Right? And we had yes. a discussion about that last week. Okay. And I think 
it seems like the more data you add, the sort of more mixed up this becomes. And I think it's, you know, one could make the argument that we don't know if it's truly anomalous everywhere, or if it's normal, or what the normal should be. <laughs> yes. So, okay. So, Torsten's point is that, the, okay, so Tonga, which I'm pointing out right now, is this really clear example. But if you go over here to the Andes, um, you do have um, a change as you go along. And you can, as you look around, you also, it is perpendicular here, Cascadia. Um, it gets very messy over here. Um, so, there is, a, there is also variation in the measurements that have been made. And I, um, so I will say now that where I'm going to end up with this talk is that um, it, it is complicated in that, um, that uh, I would say 15 years ago we kind of were looking for this simple solution and that is going to um, be this B-type olivine fabric that I will show you in a second. Um, and then it also became clear for modeling that was done partly by Peter Van Kecken's group that that doesn't solve the problem because you, you also don't access that fabric type. And um, I think what it's been left off is that the flow field in these subduction zones is relatively complex. And there's modeling that's been done, including by Torsten, showing that you have very complex flow fields. Um, and where we need to go with this, and this is where I'm going to end up in the talk, is coupling those two models that predict olivine fabric evolution and see if we can really match those observations um, using the current generation of modeling tools that are out there. So this is this is um, this observation now that is um, seven years old, or this I should say this is a compilation that um, Maureen and Torsten presented, showing um, these global ob observations that you do get the trench parallel splitting. You do also get some perpendicular, some stuff at various angles, and that it is that the flow of subduction zones. I think the consensus would be that it is a complex pattern, um, and that it has become. Um, as I'm going to show you in the rest of this talk, that relating this to the rheology, we have the tools to do it, but there is still a lot that we um, need to do to understand how everything relates. Um, so this is, uh, so I, I showed you in the at the very beginning that the easy slip system in olivine, the most common slip system in olivine is this A-type slip system, this 100 on the 010 plane. Um, and then about in, well, going back to 2001, there was a suggestion made that the way to explain this trench parallel splitting was to have this B-type olivine fabric. Um, and so this is, again, just a schematic of showing what the pole figure would look like for that lattice preferred orientation of the olivine grains um, and what that means in terms of the slip system. So in this case, you are slipping in the 010 direction on the 001 plane. And by doing that, because you're changing which is the dominant alignment and where the A axis, your seismically fast axis, how that is aligned in the system, you can still have the trench perpendicular flow it's just that you have a different, you're accommodating that flow in a different slip system. And so you no longer have the seismically fast axis being aligned with the direction of flow. And that's the key to this B-type slip system, which is by having the A axis in this orientation, it is no longer tracking your flow direction. But you can still, if you have type B flow, you can still interpret what the, the pattern of flow is if you are in this regime. Um, and so. Another schematic from this review paper um, summarizing that is that with both um, with these various types of um, fabric systems, so the olivine A type or the B type, um, the uh, mantle flow direction in both these cases is the same, but what you're measuring in terms of the seismically fast direction is different because you, activate, you, are, you have a different orientation of your um, olivine crystal lattice. And so the fast axis, the olivine A axis, is now in this system is now oriented like this, but the flow is still going away from the trench in this scenario. So this is this was the hypothesis um, about well going back to 2001 that the way to explain the trench parallel splitting is that you do have flow um, going in towards the trench as you would expect um, based on the plate motion. It's just that the olivine A, A axis no longer records the seismically fast, the, so it no longer records the mantle flow direction. Um, this hypothesis has now fallen out of favor for various reasons. One of them is uh, this modeling study that was done by Eric Nella um, with Peter Van Kecken showing, so the problem with the B-type fabric is that you have to go to very high stress. And to get there, their models suggest that you really only access, you can really only activate this fabric type as you go all the way up into the very nose of the mantle wedge, and that you need that really high strain regime to access that. 
Um, and so that's one line of evidence why I would say in general people no longer favor this as the explanation um, for, for um, why you have this trench parallel splitting. Um, another thing, and this is what I'm going to spend time going into, is that we actually, um, this, uh, one of the great things about that Jung and Collado study, which um, developed this B-type hypothesis, is it kind of um, spurred people to start really um, looking back into fabrics again. Um, and we now um, have this whole variety of different subsystems that we talk about in prototypes. And I'm, I'm going to come back and talk about this in more detail. Um, but the, the take home from this slide is, so I showed you A type and B type. Um, we now also have observations both experimentally and from field samples of these C type, D type, E type. And there's actually a sixth type that we are finding often um, related to the presence of melt. So the way in which olivine aligns during flow, while it is true that this is the most commonly observed type, there are many field examples now where you are seeing a different type of fabric alignment. What this means in terms of seismic anisotropy, um, the, the real key thing is actually getting this um, switch where the A-axis is not aligned, um, is having the A-axis in this orientation to really change how you would um, in, interpret the mantle flow direction from the anisotropy, which is um, captured a little bit in this figure. Because in this one, they are saying, if you have A, C, or E type, then you still, your seismically fast direction is still the flow direction. So in terms of, um, you have to think geometrically about how, because your A-axis is the fastest, you always have to think about how this orientation um, how that relates to the flow direction. And in some of these other slip systems, D-type and E-type, the A-axis is still the slip direction. And so in those cases, you don't expect to change. Um, you, you expect the A-axis to map onto your um, flow direction. But where you have a change to, say, a B-type fabric is when you would really expect um, a difference in how you're interpreting the seismic anisotropy. So as I said um, a little bit ago, the general consensus is that mantle flow is very complex in three dimensions. And so this is this nice figure from Maureen Long and Paul Silver's paper, um, just showing that you have um, corner flow. You may also have 3D flow around the slab. And that um, the general take home from all of this um, work on the seismic anisotropy is that it's, it's a much more complicated system. Um, and so what I want to show you today is what it is about the olivine LPO side of things, um, what the observations are that we've had since this kind of flurry of activity on the shear wave splitting, um, and uh, first of all, kind of how we get this data on the olivine, and then how we can use it to help us um, to interpret what's going on with these large-scale seismic observations. So I'm going to start out um, talking about deformation uh, by dislocation mechanisms in olivine and pick up where Phil Scammer left off last week in talking about these basic rheology aspects. Um, and then I'm going to spend some time talking about how do we actually measure the crystallographic preferred orientation in rocks? Um, what are the constraints? What are the ways in which we do it? Um, and then looking again at this range of crystallographic preferred orientations that have been identified. Um, and then finally talking about the ways in which we can incorporate all of this um, data that's come online about CPOs into mantle flow models and um, understand uh, subduction zones better. Okay, so as a recap, the mantle or the upper mantle is predominantly composed of prototype. So that is another picture of a hand sample here. Um, and that rock, the um, most of what you see in that kind of olive green is the olivine in it. It's 60 to 80 percent of the rock. Um, and then the second most dominant mineral is orthopyroxene, which is the darker patch, as you can see on the hand sample there. Um, and then there is some amount of clinopyroxene, spinel, and sulfide. So when we worry about the rheology of the mantle, we pretty much only worry about olivine, or we wor worry about olivine and orthopyroxene. Um, clinopyroxene, uh, if it um, is present, is probably similar rheologically to the orthopyroxene. And these two things are present at such trace levels that they really are not impacting the rheology of this material. So we mainly talk about um, olivine rheology. And from lab experiments, we almost exclusively have measurements of olivine that are constraining the rheology. Um, in terms of the lab, um, but we do the, um, we do also uh, try to get some constraint on how orthopyroxene is influencing the deformation. Um, the reason that we really focus on olivine is that it is um, just constraining this rheology has, has been 30, 40 years of lab experiments and also field observations. Um, and orthopyroxene, 
uh, is actually much harder to deform in the lab. It's harder to, to um, access the pressure temperature regime where you're in the right um, orthopedic zone structure. And it also turns out that if you start to deform these mixtures, um, that you are much closer to the melting temperature when you're at lab conditions, right? So when you put orthopyroxene in here, then you lower the melting temperature of the whole system. And so it makes, experimentally, it makes things much more messy. So the fact that we simplify the mantle to being olivine um, is not that we are not aware that orthopyroxene isn't there, but just that um, it's been a lot of work to get to the state that we are today in terms of lab experiments for olivine, and it's also a very non-trivial problem to look at these mixed phase rheologies. Um, but there, but there is there is some work out there looking at orthopyroxene as well. Okay, and so this is now a slide from Phil Scammer from what he showed last week, and he talked a little bit about dislocation creep, and this is one of the typical schematics. Um, that is often shown to talk about um, the way that dislocate, dislocation creep operates at the microstructural level, right? And this is this also gets back to one of the points that Uli did a really nice job of emphasizing yesterday, which is that we need these defects in the crystals to um, see all of the properties that are going on in terms of rheology, right? So in this example, there is a missing atom here, and that um, when you apply a stress, that results in the propagation of that dislocation through the crystal lattice. Um, and so that is, uh, in terms of um, flow in the upper mantle, our best estimate is that the deformation is by a dislocation mechanism. Um, and so this is the underlying um, process that is going on as you're deforming those individual crystals. But as, as you do that, that also results in them, you, you preferentially slip on certain planes. So those LPOs that I showed, you're preferentially slipping um, in the easy slip system. You're In olivine, you're preferentially slipping on the O10 plane in the in the 100 direction. And so there are certain planes that are easier to slip on in an, um, in an orthorhombic crystal or in an anisotropic crystal, and that is what ultimately gives rise to that lattice preferred orientation. So if um, you are having a, um, if visualizing these dislocations is a little bit um, complicated, we fortunately um, have this great set of experiments that were actually published in 1947 using soap bubbles um, in a dish of water um, that you can use to visualize this. So, okay, so this is a movie that I'm about to play. These are a whole bunch of soap bubbles. Um, this is actually sitting in a pirate's dish, so you will eventually see the writing on the dish. These, the green here, and there's some green there, are two um, plastic spaces that you can use um, to kind of push the system and make the dislocations move around. And so what you're going to see is that um, you will start to see these uh, dislocations moving around as the whole system is moved. So you can see one going through there and other ones moving around. And there's a vacancy. So, um, so this is, you can play around and just keep poking this whole system. So in this case, the whole thing separated, which is not an analogy to anything. It's really the, um, the yes, yeah, so we now have a plate boundary interface. Um, so don't take it that far. But this, seeing that, like, being able to look at these moving around is, it's, this is what um, is happening in the crystals to our, our best estimate based on, of years of study of not just olivine, but any material in this dislocation regime. Okay, so this is an, another one of Phil's slides. Um, this is the olivine flow law. This comes up over and over again when, we're worrying, when we worry about the ductile rheology. So this is the strain rate related to this pre-exponential factor, the stress, um, the strain-dependent viscous anisotropy that we won't worry much about today, but the stress, the grain size, water if it's present, melt if it's present, and then the temperature and pressure term. So this is the one equation that keeps coming up over and over again. Um, and through the lab experiments, uh, we can build these deformation mechanism maps. So this is, again, one of the slides that Phil Schema showed. Um, this is grain size here on this axis. Um, in microns, this is the stress. And these are contours for strain rate. And depending on the grain size in the mantle and also what the stress is during your flow, then you will be in various um, of these deformation regimes. So dislocation creep, 
um, dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding and diffusion creep. Um, we're not going to worry about diffusion creep today. If we were talking about um, shear localization and ductile shear zones at the plate interface, then we would start really worrying about diffusion creep because this is in the ductile regime the way that we um, get to shear localization and very um, high deformation. Uh, but if we're talking about flow in the mantle, um, we are in either the dislocation creep regime or more likely, based on current data, we are in this dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding regime. So this um, intermediate regime, it has a grain size dependency, um, but it also, it is a dislocation accommodated mechanism. And so you also expect to end up having a lattice preferred orientation. Um, and that is summarized here. So this is just showing an aggregate of crystals that you're deforming. Um, and that if you have dislocation creep, as you're moving around those dislocations, because you have preferential slip systems, you expect to get an alignment of your crystallographic lattice. Um, in diffusion creep, when you're moving things around, you're moving everything by diffusion. And as Uli discussed yesterday, we think a lot of the diffusion is actually um, it's accommodated on the grain boundaries. And we don't expect to see any lattice preferred orientation. So if our expectation would be that if the mantle was dominantly deforming by diffusion creep, we would not expect to see seismic anisotropy. So the fact that we do see this seismic anisotropy is one of the arguments that we are in some type of dislocation mechanism. Um, and then there's this third re regime called dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding, often abbreviated as DISGBS. Um, and this is both grain size dependent as diffusion creep is, but it does produce a lattice preferred orientation. Yes? So, I read a few places that the deeper part of the upper mantle is often thought to be in the diffusion creep yes. regime. Is, is that still um, assumed? And, and what, what would be controlling the boundary with depth of where you get into the diffusion creep um, zone? So the, the, my understanding is that the current, you know, the, the idea for the, for the asthenosphere is that it is more or less 200 kilometers thick starting below the plate interface. And that is where we see the seismic anisotropy signal. And below that, that disappears, but you're still in the upper mantle. And that is one explanation is that you've transitioned into diffusion creep. Because this equation is really complex, um, it depends not just, so one way to get into diffusion creep is to really decrease the grain size. But the other things that become important as you go deeper is this term. And in particular, um, the activation volume becomes really important when you go deeper. So another way to get into diffusion creep is to increase P. And I think because of the activation vol volume term, then you, you can also get into diffusion creep. Yeah, I was just going to comment on that. What comes to the grain size, it figures out like it should, like it says, based on the depth dependence of those parameters alone. <laughs> If this is being recorded, I'll just say that Torsten agreed with me, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> um, for constant grain size. Yes, for, const for constant grain size, it's really that pressure term. And uh, yeah, um, there, there is, yeah. It gets messy as well, right? Because there's also error, like the, some of these terms are harder co to constrain in the lab. And so, for example, there's a lot of error associated with that V term. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so you know, one reason for 40 years of experiments just on olivine alone is simply that there are a lot of terms in this equation. And getting to the, say, higher pressure regime and getting a good constraint on that V term has been really difficult. But that, the current estimate in the end is that we should transition to diffusion creep. Um, so OK, so, so we have at least these three mechanisms. Um, and I should say also there, there is another um, mechanism called low temperature plasticity. Um, which has, in the last couple years, received a lot of attention. Um, it is also one that is harder um, to access in the lab to make measurements on. But there is a school of thought developing that, that actually the, um, that a lot of the lithosphere, the olivine, might actually be in this low temperature plasticity regime when it's deforming. Um, but for our purposes today, we're, we're not going to worry about that. And on this map that I'm showing you here, that low temperature plasticity regime is up here at very high stress, um, though that flow law might be rewritten soon. Um, OK, so this is, again, the deformation mechanism map. This um, is taken from a publication with Lars Hansen. Um, this is showing grain size, again, in microns. Um, so a millimeter is around 10 to the 3. 
right? And in a lot of um, the field samples that we have, the grain size is somewhere on the order of a millimeter. So this is an example, this cluster of data here are measurements that we made in field samples from the Josephine prototype um, for both the grain size and the stress. Um, and based on our estimate that we are dry, melt-free, and that the deformation in this case was at around 1,000 degrees C, we calculate this deformation mechanism map um, for the flow laws, putting in all the parameters for that equation I showed earlier. And then for our samples, we had measured grain size and we had estimated stress uh, based, in this case, on a subgrain size piezometer. And so we end up that we are deforming somewhere near 10 to the minus 12 per second. So that's a reasonable tectonic strain rate. And it also we end up kind of squarely in this dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding regime. Um, so to our best estimate, I mean, I think there's for the um, kind of asthenospheric portion of the mantle and even parts of the lithosphere, we are in some type of dislocation mechanism. Um, there is still a lot of back and forth about um, the dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding versus dislocation creep, but that doesn't change really what, um, what we worry about in terms of the CPOs that are developing. Okay, so now I really want to um, show you how we measure crystallographic, the crystallographic preferred orientation in rocks. Um, and, and how we make those um, measurements going from looking at field samples. Uh, and so one final link back to what Phil Schema showed last week. So this is another one of his si slides. Um, he had this nice summary of microstructural analysis. Um, and so you can do a variety of things when you have samples of rocks, either the naturally deformed prototypes that we collect in the field or the experimentally deformed samples. So you can look at the grain size. Um, you can look at dislocation structures. Um, you can also uh, do these EBSD measurements that I will go into, um, and you can ultimately look at the lattice preferred orientation of your samples. So if we want to do this with field samples, oh, and actually, sorry, one, t one more terminology thing. So I've been switching between saying CPO and LPO. Those are the same thing. So crystallographic, for crystallographic preferred orientation or lattice preferred orientation refer to the same thing. Um, and there's just being this... Uh, use of both terms in the field. OK, so ways in which we get um, samples of prototype at the surface of the Earth, right? So the, the problem with trying to study the mantle is that the crust gets in the way all the time. So one of the most common ways to look at samples um, is to look at mantle xenoliths that are brought to the surface in basaltic lavas. So this is um, an example of uh, some Hawaiian xenoliths. So these are um, them out in the field. They are coated with some, um, some of the basalt on the exterior. But if you break it open, you see this nice, fresh um, prototype in here. Uh, another way that we can look at samples, oh, and so the limitation on looking at xenoliths, because xenoliths are probably um, give us the best uh, distribution space, spatially um, in that there are a lot of places where you're getting, you know, xenoliths, uh, especially if they're kimberlitic, they can come up from very deep. So some of the deepest mantle samples that we have available to us are those xenoliths and xenocris coming up in kimberlites. Um, and they often are, you know, in cratonic areas um, or volcanic areas, you're getting them where you, you're not going to find the other types of um, exposures you get. Uh, where you can get um, collisional, where the other types that I'll show in a sec. So xenoliths, there's um, probably the best spatial distrib distribution globally for xenoliths. But um, the limitation on them is that you have no orientation information. So if you're worrying about rheology, and particularly if you're worrying about how the olivine orientation relates to um, the, the seismic anisotropy, ultimately, you actually need to have some structural context for how you're interpreting the sample. And I'll show, how, I'll show you the, the frame of reference that we use in a second. Um, and the key thing is that we need to know what the foliation and the lineation is in these samples. And you can see, looking at this sample, that it's, it's really hard to figure that out from these samples. Um, and I think often the way this is done, to some extent, is assuming it. Though um, there are some tools coming online that I think might improve the situation. Um, and so because of this limitation, uh, one of the um, other ways that we look at mantle samples, and one of the real advantages of this example, is going to orogenic prototypes or ophiolites, um, which are obducted pieces of crust and mantle, or sometimes just the mantle section, um, that you find in collisional environments. So this is the most uh, famous ophiolite example, which is the Oman ophiolite, which is highlighted here on this map of Oman. Um, which is the largest exposure that we have. This um, formed, this was abducted onto land. This is associated, this was, the interpretation is that the, 
um, mantle and crust you see here were once a spreading ridge and then they uh, became part of a subduction zone environment and then got pushed up when, um, during collision. Uh, and so if you go here, you can um, do really nice detailed transects. So this is an example from Nick Digert's work. Now just focusing on one of the massifs that are present where you can um, walk in, you know always where you are relative to the crust. So they're lavas and then sheeted gabbros, um, and then you end up in the mantle. So you always know your structural context, or at least the local structural context. And you can do your best job at um, relating the orientation of your samples to, um, in this case, even the orientation of the moho. And so you, you can really uh, relate your olivine fabrics that you ultimately, ultimately measure to um, how that orientation relates to um, that piece of mantle relative uh, to the crust and the assumed paleo ridge axis in this case. Um, the other places uh, where we have um, prototype abducted on land, but we don't have the associated crust. So we have less structural information in this context. So this is an example. We are down here at the moment in Berkeley. Um, and this is the California-Oregon border. And this is the Josephine prototype up here. So this is an example of these samples in the field. Um, this is actually prototype that you're looking at. If you're thinking that it should be green, the reason that it's not is that all prototype um, that, that is not in Xenolus is pretty much uh, always weathered. And so the orogenic and ophiolite prototypes, the um, olivine, the iron in them oxidizes and essentially rusts in the field. So when you look at prototypes in the field, you're always looking at these red or orange rocks. Um, and so this is actually prototype. And if you um, hammer off a piece of the outcrop, then you will see something that uh, is darker in color. But this is what prototype looks like in the field. Um, so the Josephine prototype we, um, is, a, is a really nice large exposure prototype. We don't have that, the, um, because it, it, it is, um, has thrust faults bounding on all sides, we can't directly relate it to um, depth below the moho and the kind of paleo ridge orientation. But we can go in the field and, for example, identify this foliation, which you can see really nicely in this image. And we can take samples relative to that foliation, which is, um, which is the way in which we uh, ultimately want to orient our samples, is to know what the um, kind of the uh, shear direction was. And so the foliation that we see around here is actually very helpful in this case. And this is something that is, is much harder to identify in those uh, xenolith hand samples. Um, no, no, this is like waist high. Somewhere I have a version with a, with a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> This, this, is a, this is a very comfortable rock for sitting on top of and eating your lunch. It, it is, this outcrop is called the lunch spot outcrop. Yes. Just maybe um, explain foliation and lineation. I don't know whether you, you did that. So, okay, so the, the foliation in this, the, so foliation is a planar, um, a, a planar alignment that you see or um, layering that you get. And so this is the foliation. And it's a foliation because it, you can follow it around as you go around that outcrop. And a, then a lineation would be like individual crystals that are stretched out. And that, and that is the lineation. And so to do that, you really have to get up much closer and look at, um, and look at the outcrop to find, to find the orientation of your lineation. Um, and I, I will show some examples in a second of, of what the observations are that we're making on the outcrop. Um, but just before I do that, I want to make this other point, which is if you really want to look at the rocks in their structural context and you want to look at the subduction zones or ridges, this is a problem. And the problem is that we do have prototype exposures on the seafloor, but the water is in the way. And it is a limiting factor, right? So, so Oman and the Josephine prototype are great, but we don't um, we infer what their tectonic setting was when those um, when those fabrics and when the deformation occurred. Um, and if you really want to have things in their present day context, you need to go to the sea floor. Um, we do have uh, pretty good tools at the moment to do that, right? So ocean drilling has been one way in which um, you can really get samples in situ, and when that core comes up, you have orientation information associated with that core. Um, the limitation in that case is that drilling one hole is itself a very expensive proposition, so it's hard to go around and get lots of um, different samples or do 
um, transects or anything like that. Um, dredging, this is a dredge basket with a person for scale. So the dredge basket is nice and big. It can bring up a lot of rock, but it is, um, the, so, so the dredge basket is a very efficient way to sample at sea, but obviously you lose any outcrop scale or context when you do that. All you know is that you've sampled a kilometer of the sea floor. You might have sampled one outcrop, you might have sampled 10. But this is the most common way in which we have sea floor samples. Um, for Tonga, we have a nice suite of prototypes, but everything is dredged, so we don't know. Um, that, that is actually the challenge in trying to do any fabric work on the samples is that we don't really know how they relate to the orientation that they're in in the outcrop. Um, and then if you do want to get at oriented work, um, using submersibles or ROVs, it is um, possible to sample with um, like seeing the visual of what you're sampling. Um, the subs are actually not quite set up that you could really take oriented samples. Um, the Shinkai is actually the best in that it gives you heading information and you can reconstruct it to some extent. But um, it's still, you know, doing one dive is also very expensive and it's actually hard to get a, lo a lot of samples. You know, a good dive would be bringing up something like 10 samples in a day. Um, so those are the limitations of trying to really look at the mantle in its setting, right? So we do have places on the seafloor at ridges and in trenches where you have exposures of the mantle. It is now frozen in lithosphere, but you do have direct exposures of the mantle. Um, but the sampling is a little bit difficult. Okay, and so then there's this, um, this uh, structural context that we need to look at samples in. So when we tell you the LPO of a sample, it is always relative, or it should always be relative to the foliation and the lineation in a sample. And that is because we want to be looking at the cross section through your shear plane. So this is an example, this is just a hypothetical cube of rock that has a foliation, which is shown by these lines. So this is the foliation plane that you are seeing here. And then a lineation would be any stretched out feature that you see in that. So in the case of the prototype, it would simply be um, elongated crystals of your olivine or your orthopyroxene. And that is how you identify the lineation in these samples. And this, this foliation plane that contains the lineation, that is your shear plane. Right, so that is, you're assuming that is where the orientation of the deformation. And when we look at um, the LPO samples, we want to look at the cross section through that. And so in structural geology, we always orient our thin sections so that they are cut perpendicular to foliation and parallel to lineation. And that's a standard thing, not just looking at the mantle, but looking at any um, field samples of a shear zone or any deformed crustal rocks as well. That the, the um, the frame of reference is always this XZ, sometimes it's called XY structural plane, which is the cross section sh through your shear plane. So to do that, and, and so when, um, let's close the loop on this, just when I show you this LPO, so we have cut our thin section plane, which is the gray one up there, and we have then gone and looked at the orientation of all the axes on that plane. And then we are plotting things up relative to that thin section plane. Um, and so in this case, you're, um, in this uh, figure that Luke Mel made, the A-axis um, is generally aligned uh, with the shear direction, and so that is your slip direction. This, I mean, this is just a schematic of, of how we link going from this field sample to the thin section plane with a whole bunch of crystals in it, um, measuring the orientation, and then plotting them up on the LPO. And I will show you in more detail how we actually measure that LPO. But this um, foliation lineation issue is, is difficult in the prototypes. Um, so this is, a, is actually a relatively deformed sample from Oman. This is uh, what we would call a protomyelinite. So it's associated with a shear zone um, that's thought to be a paleo transform fault. Um, and the reason I'm putting it up is that this is a better example of being able to identify the foliation. Um, if anybody would like to raise their hand and tell me if they see the foliation, they are welcome to do that right now. Yeah, so, so a number of people are, are giving me this hand signal. So, <laughs> so it is, it is um, something like this, and um, it is a little, it, it, is mu it is harder to do off the photo as well, right? So when we're the outcrop, we spend a while poking around. You want to, ideally, right, you're trying to f identify a plane of feature, so you want to look on this side as well, and so you spend a while poking around, finding as many um, different faces as you can. Um, and then I would also say that the lineation is, um, something like this in the sample. But again, you would want to look at a couple different surfaces of your outcrop to determine this. So this is something that's associated with a shear zone. Um, 
but in the mantle, the flow in the mantle, um, like all the prototypes that you see, those have all, um, we assume have all undergone some amount of mantle flow. And so the fabrics that we're talking about, these are, are much more subtle, much more coarse grain features. So this is another example. Um, this is a Hasbergite, not a, so, this is kind of really the out, outer limits of the shear zone. This does not have a lot of grain size reduction, so we don't associate it with this really high strain deformation associated with a um, localized fault zone. In this case, we are interpreting the, um, the foliation that we see here as reflecting the flow in the mantle. And so again, we identified on our crop that we had something approximately horizontal that we're looking at. You can see the grain size here. This is not a very fine-grained rock. This is, this is what um, ductilely deformed upper mantle. This is what we think it looks like. Um, and so one final example um, is this one, which is kind of what most of the samples look like that we see in the field. Um, I think we also, I think every, all of these are oriented so that the foliation is, is approximately horizontal. Um, but, but these are subtle features. It's not um, easy. We, you know, often we kind of do this by committee. You know, you have a couple people in the field and you, you know, you kind of discuss it back and forth. It's not a really obvious thing. If you're looking at kind of, um, well, crustal rocks, especially if you have micas, then it can be really obvious to find the foliation. If you're looking at myelinite zones, it can be much easier. But this, this is one of the difficulties in doing this. Um, there is uh, um, a potentially a new technique that could really help, um, which is uh, shown in this paper by um, Vasilio Shetzaris and um, the group at um, University of Wisconsin uh, did this, um, have started doing this more routinely, which is to do um, X-ray computed uh, tomography of samples and use that to identify the spinel fabric. And so what they're showing is a um, xenolith hand sample here. Um, and then this is the um, tomographic image where the blue is, um, it's not all the spinel, it's kind of enlarged ellipsoids that they assign to each spinel grain to help them identify the fabric. Um, and so then using that, they determined that um, this would be the shear plane, and so the relevant cross-sectional plane that they need is this one, which is the face on which they cut it. Um, for prototype, the biggest limitation of this technique is that you can really only identify the spinel easily in these, um, in these tomographic images uh, because the contrast between the other phases in prototype between olivine and orthopyxine is um, very difficult. Uh, it's, they've got a very, um, they don't have much contrast difference um, when you look at them. This is the same as looking at a backscattered electron image for those that are familiar with it. And so the thing that's easiest to get out of this data set is the spinel. Um, and so this assumes that the spinel shape preferred fabric is um, accurately reflecting the foliation and the lineation in the rock. And it's not, um, it's not necessarily clear that it is. Uh, uh, spinel is um, sometimes its own mystery in the way it behaves. Um, can be a little complicated. But this, I think this is a really promising way of at least trying to be more systematic, particularly with, with samples like this, right? And it's, you know, another problem that we have, and this happens with seafloor samples as well, is that, you know, this sample comes up, somebody else might have, you know, just cut it in half to do some geochemical analyses on it, and so you're left with a half of the sample, and then you need to look at a couple planes to identify foliation and lineation, and so you're left with this tiny cube of sample. And so, um, it, it can be, just the sample size can be really limiting in terms of doing this, orienting your fabric data the correct way. Okay, so this is, this is kind of the dirty tricks of the trade that nobody will talk about when you go and see that LPO data. Um, and so you, you have to always take it on faith that they have done a good job of figuring out the LPO. Um, and then one other point to make is that um, in prototypes, the alteration can make um, uh, doing this work really difficult. So this is um, in the lab last week or the um, tutorial, you guys looked at some of these samples from Tonga that cover this full spectrum from being completely fresh to completely altered. So in our ideal world, all of our samples that we get would have this level of alteration. But of course, that's not the case. A lot of xenoliths look like this. I would say a lot of orogenic prototypes and ophiolite, ophiolites <laughs> tend to look like this. And a lot of seafloor samples tend to look like the, the 3, 4, 5 spectrum. Um, and actually, for that reason, uh, so obviously with that, we have no olivine. You're never going to get CPO data. But um, you can do something with a sample like this. But this is one of the reasons that actually, if you look at the at um, ridge samples in particular, there's, there's almost no fabric work that's been done on them. Because doing analysis of this, and particularly these days, we want to do things automated. This requires really 
um, complex post-processing. Uh, and so that, that has been kind of another limiting factor that, that people have tended to focus on these samples, but there are, um, there are a lot of, you know, that limits the areas that you can look at in some cases. Okay, and then in thin section, what are we actually looking at? So these samples, these are the examples of samples that have undergone flow in the mantle, and they will have a crystallographic alignment when you measure the crystal orientations. So that means that when you measure the orientation of this olivine grain and this olivine grain and this olivine grain, that they will show some general alignment, and that reflects the um, flow by, di by dislocation mechanism in the mantle. What you see in thin section, you see um, these are subgrain boundaries. This is also called undulose extinction. This grain here also has it really nicely. So those are subgrain boundaries that have formed because of the deformation that the rock has undergone. Um, this sample is a little bit more deformed. Th this one is more deformed than this one. Um, and there's a little bit of recrystallization that's gone on in some grain size reduction, but still relatively large grain size. So this is, when we're talking about kind of Mantle rocks and LPO, this, this is what these things look like in thin section. These are, um, when you're talking about mineral alignment, these do have a mineral alignment, but grain size is on the order of millimeters, so you've got to zoom out and measure a whole bunch of grains to get at that mineral alignment. Mm -hmm. The general rule of thumb is that you need 200 grain measurements or more to get an accurate representation of the fabric. Um, and, uh, and so, and it's also, you know, if you, if you look at a myelinate, it's obvious, you know, you get hundreds and thousands of grains in, in just one field of view like this. But in this case, this is the mantle. It's relatively coarse grained. You've got to look at a lot of, a lot of grains to get out the LPO. <clears throat> so fortunately, um, in the old days, this used to be done by U-stage, which is basically sitting at a petrographic microscope and for each grain finding its angles of extinction and doing that one by one. And that um, is obviously very time consuming. But uh, the other thing is that um, there's a lot more information you get if you can actually map the orientation of, um, of not just every grain, but um, every kind of pixel in the grain, and look at the subgrain orientations, and look at the relative misorientation between the grain boundaries, something that Uli was talking about yesterday. And so in the last 15 years, um, looking at LPOs has really um, taken off thanks to this technique, which is electron backscatter diffraction. So what you're seeing here is a scanning electron microscope. This is the sample chamber. The electron beam is up there. The rest of the electronics are down there. You stick your sample in this thing. And if you have an electron backscatter diffraction detector, it sits here. And we also nowadays run this with the energy dispersive spectrometer running as well. So EDS gives us composition. EBSD gives us mineral orientation. Um, it's now uh, basically trivial to collect both data sets at the same time. So we always get the compositional data um, at the same time because it helps us in processing and IDing mineral phases. Um, the basis for this EBSD analysis, so this is an image in the SEM. So your electron beam comes down here. Your sample is sitting here. It has to be at the 70, de 70 degree tilt to see the diffraction pattern. And this is the EBSD detector, um, and that's the EDS. So this EBSD detector is a phosphor screen. When the electron beam comes down, it causes lattice diffraction in your crystal. And that lattice diffraction gives um, this image. And that is imaged by this. Um, it illuminates the phosphor screen. And then there's a camera that takes a picture. And then there's great computer software that um, processes the whole thing for you. And so you end up saying out of this, you have this diffraction pattern. And you say, OK, this is, you identify the orientation of your crystal. And you say, this is the orientation of this olivine crystal. And so nowadays, you can go across and you, know, you get hundreds and hundreds of points. Um, just by mapping across a sample. And so this now is an example of an EBSD map uh, that Lars Hansen collected. Uh, this is one of the samples from the Josephine prototype, so relatively undeformed. Um, and you can see it is slightly pixelated, because we've set, um, I think we had a step size in this case of about 2 microns. So every 2 microns, we got a diffraction pattern. We figured out the orientation of that diffraction pattern. And so we can then plot up the data here. So this is um, showing you actually both the olivine orientation in green and the orthopyroxene orientation in blue. And they um, have their orientations, uh, the shear, the, actually, I think the, um, the relative it's a relative plot here. But, but these samples have all, um, we're looking at them all in a specific frame of reference that we have tied ultimately to the foliation that we measured in the field. So this data set um, has this spatial relationship that we know relative to how we sampled those, um, 
these samples in the field and then cut the thin sections. Um, and you can also see this, that um, all of this cross-cutting stuff, that's the serpentine. Um, and so we're not indexing it um, serpentine because it's a very soft mineral. We can never um, polish it well enough to get data off of it. Uh, but in this case, the serpentinization is not too bad. And we can extract out of this um, not just orientation, but the grain size, the subgrain size, and a whole bunch of other data that's really useful. Yeah. From, from your experience or other studies, does the serpentinite tend to just erase and step over the original LPO to um, exploit it and form parallel to it? Or is there any relationship between the orientation of the serpentinite grains and the original fabric of the rock? In these coarse grain samples, we don't tend to see a relationship. Um, in uh, fault zones, we, um, where we have um, much more grain size reduction in myelinite formation, we do think we see a relationship between the serpentine orientation um, and, the, and the fabric of the rock. And we think that uh, probably relates to the overall um, uh, applied stress of that fault zone. But in this case, uh, it's, it seems pretty random. I apologize if you just said this. How did you? How are, do you define the shear direction relative to the foliation plane? Oh, okay. I didn't actually say this. So this is this is an example taken from these small shale, small scale shear zones in the Josephine prototype. And in this case, we actually can. Um, it's a shear zone that's about 100 meters wide, and we can identify the shear plane, and the and we actually can track the foliation bending into it and back out. So in this case, we have two independent measures of shear plane and foliation plane. I would say in most cases, we would be happy to just be able to identify the foliation. Um, and we normally don't have this additional information. OK, so then this is the LPO. From this example, this is the LPO that we end up getting. And if we interpret this LPO relative to the foliation, so the foliation is now plotted at this slight angle to the shear plane. The A axis is approximately aligned with that. So we would say we are slipping in the A direction, and that the slip plane in this case is more or less the O10 plane, the B plane. So this is just a type A example, this easy slip system in olivine. Um, but there is. Uh, and so, so this is kind of going from, from field observations to actually getting the LPO itself. In this case, this is um, very closely linked into spatial uh, structural measurements that we made in the field. Um, and we could take it one step further. further. This is not uh, for that same data set. This is just an example from a review paper by Phil Skema and Lars Hansen, um, which is to say that um, nowadays it is very routine to take your EBSD data set um, and to calculate the elasticity tensor from that, and then to calculate what that means in terms of the splitting and the magnitude of the splitting. And that is um, almost always done these days um, using in MATLAB using this toolbox that has come online called MTEX. And that's a great resource that um, has been developed uh, and made available to the community. Um, and so you will see in a lot of papers that look at olivine LPOs that they go this step further and calculate the seismic wave properties as well. Okay, so this is that was kind of the nuts and bolts of how we get at CPOs and and um, you know what the limitations are in, in field samples we can get, and uh, also um, kind of uh, you know what what the measurements are that we're making in the lab of these samples, um, and so then I start out by saying you know. Initially, uh, we all, you know, everybody said, well, there's kind of this easy slip system in olivine. That's the dominant fabric that we see. And then there's been a lot of back and forth about other types of slip system, slip systems that might occur. And so I want to look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, and so this is, again, that slide I showed earlier on, looking at this um, fact that in subduction zones, one way to still have your um, mantle flow direction be um, uh, going towards the trench, but not, um, but this, but decouple that from the seismically fast direction is if you can get into this type B fabric. Um, but it turns out, and so this relates um, to this very um, influential paper by John Corrado in 2001, where they experimentally measured these different fabrics in olivine, and they produced this plot. This is an updated version from 2006, where they said, okay, the type A fabric tends to plot at these water and stress conditions, and type B plots up here. So if you put a lot of water into your mantle and you also are at high stress, then you can have this different fabric. 
Um, but it, it now seems pretty clear that um, it's pretty unusual to get to those very high stress conditions. Um, and that's been shown by modeling and also from field observations. Um, and then the other thing is that this has kind of led to this cottage industry of measuring uh, fabrics in many more samples. And um, it also helps that the John Corrado sample study came, happened around about the time that EBSD really became available to a lot of people. And so that combination of things means that there have been, in the last 15 years or so, there have been many studies that have gone and looked at the LPOs of various um, uh, xenoliths and organic phototypes and amanophyllite to look at the fabric types. And over the years, there have been this accumulation of um, extension of the alphabet uh, to these various fabric types that we identify. Um, but in some sense, we've actually known this for a very long time. So this is a very classic paper by Carter and Avey Laumont from 1970. And they had um, what you could almost call the, the previous version of um, that Jaron Corrado diagram, which is showing that the olivine, the dominant slip system in olivine, changes as a function of temperature and strain rate, and also as a um, as a function of the confining pressure. Right. So this um, here is the type A or easy slip system. This I think is the um, type D. Um, and so actually, what what um, this diagram does not, this one, you know. I think the consensus now is that this is kind of one way of looking at the data, but there are other things that matter. And one of, you know, two of the things go back to this very early work in 1970, which is that the pressure and the temperature should also be playing a role. Um, uh, you know, another thing that, that we know now, so this is um, some data from Katsu Mishibayashi's lab um, in Japan. So he has a very recent study in 2016 uh, presenting a compilation of fabric data for a whole bunch of different prototypes. Um, and so this is a thing now that with EBSD, there's just been this explosion in data that's available. And so uniquely in this study, they have, um, so this is a map showing the different field localities. And then this shows the number of samples they have from the different localities. So this is, 241 is still a huge number of samples to have in one study. And um, relevant to this group here is that for trenches, they have 144 prototypes that they analyzed. And so if this whole type B hypothesis were correct, we would expect that we would see dominantly um, type B fabrics in those trench prototypes. This is a summary figure in the paper just showing that they, um, in, in all of the samples, they find all of these different fabric types. And they also um, include the uh, seismic velocity calculation for one component. Um, and then they also developed what they call a fabric index, which allows them to look at histograms of the different fabric types that they have. And so if um, type B slip dominated at subduction zones or at trenches, then we would expect, so the, the fabric type is up here. So there's B is here, A, D, E, C. Um, this is the way in which they're doing this is a little bit complicated. But the, the main take home I want you to have from this is that trench prototypes are plotted here. And um, there's actually an impressive number of samples in this. And the most dominant fabric that they're seeing is this type A, or the easy slip in olivine. Um, so I think that, uh, but the, and then there are, you know, scattering this AG type um, is probably related to meld, and then there are some other, the D type as well. So one of the things that we're seeing, yes? So what are trench prototypes? How do they get there? What, what, what are they? Yeah, so th that's, uh, that is another good question. So Terry's question is what are trench prototypes? And these are, um, so the samples, um, these, I think, are almost all essentially four arc prototypes, because they're not including any xenoliths in the data set. So they have samples from the Mariana Trench, the Tonga Trench, um, and, and those are all samples that have been collected either by dredging or diving from the trench. And so I would say the best approximation of what those are are four arc. But if you look at um, the results from Eric Nella's study with Peter Van Kecken, if you're going to find B-type fabric anyway, it should be in the forearc. So I think this is really, the, you know, this data is really convincing that um, B-type is, is not the explanation for what's going on, I think, anywhere in the trench because of, because of what they're showing there. Um, so I've, uh, how long do I have? Uh, do we, we, have we have 20 minutes? OK. Um, yeah, so you should have <laughs> OK, so I am going to, um, OK.
Let me uh, put this up then. So this is, this is just to finish that point. So this is the um, summary figure from Eric Neller's paper saying that from all of the geodynamic modeling they did to get to the stress and the water content you need, if you're going to see B-type fabric anywhere, it's going to be over here in the nose of the wedge. And the best observation we have now for um, samples from that region is that they are not showing that fabric type. Um, and then on top of that, we have this fact that we do you see other um, fabric types? And I think it's, um, I think it is still an area of very active work to understand what are uh, all the things that are influencing the different CPLs that you see in prototypes. And also this, um, this study by Katsu Mishibayashi, let me just skip. So this, you know, I think this is kind of one of the best databases that are out there. So one of the limitations we have at the moment with the olivine CPO data is that um, is that even just for the data that's been collected by EBSD, um, where you have where people have gone and measured the LPO, which means ultimately you're producing for every point in your map you have a set of three Euler angles that tell you the orientation in your frame of reference. That those data sets themselves are um, essentially never published with the papers. And so one of the limitations we have at the moment is that it's very hard for anyone else to go in and to start treating these as a database of fabrics and to start um, playing around with them and, and really looking at, um, looking at the large scale, say, statistical properties of these different data sets. And this is something that the um, community recognizes at the moment. There's been some push to develop a database framework for which, which would allow EBSD data to be submitted and so that people can start accessing this. Um, but this is, this is something, you know, for geochemistry and other areas, uh, online databases where you can go and download data sets. The limitation right now with all of this olivine work is that you basically can't go and download this. You have to email the individual authors, and not surprisingly, sometimes you get back the response, you know, my grad student collected this, I'm not sure where the data ended up, things like that. So, you know, I, I think in the next five years, we're moving towards a model where there will be a standard way that um, these data sets can be uploaded. Some of these data sets, you know, in an individual sample now can be several gigabytes of data. So there is also kind of a, a size problem, but you also need to have the metadata to understand the orientation that this data is reported relative to. Um, and then there's a bigger problem. If you go back to the stuff that predates EBSD, you know, there's some great fabric stuff reported in the older literature, really carefully collected by Ustage, but that the data that's forming those contour plots is, is basically gone. And so another kind of limitation is that it's really hard to mine the historical data in this case because you, you just can't do anything more than show that poll figure that they produce because that the, the data on which it's based is just not available. Um, so, you know, hopefully moving forward, we will at least have a, a standard way to look at all of this. But, you know, I think we're still, um, yeah. Yes. Prototites and high pressure metamorphic rocks that do show a B fabric. Yeah, very interesting, isn't it? Um, so, um, those are from this one locality uh, that Katsu has looked at, um, or may, there may be two localities there. Um, and they're also in the original John and Corrado paper, they report a couple other occurrences of B-type fabric, and I think they tend to be in high-pressure settings. Yeah, the, I mean, they, there are lots of great questions to ask about, you know, looking at this figure saying, okay, like why, you know, let's look at other HP settings, why, why are we getting that fabric type? You know, does that relate to the mantle floor? Is that something related to emplacement? Um, trying to get better constraints on the pressure, temperature, water content, melt content. There's a lot of parameters that also need to be constrained in this case. Um, so, so for the, the LPO side of things, I, you know, the, the last 15 years or so, we have a lot of great observations that have come out. Um, to some extent, they've uh, disproved um, the models that are out there in that we don't have a really good framework to predict when you get different LPO types. Um, and so, so that is something that uh, is, is an active area of research. And, and I think there's more that can be done experimentally. I think in terms of observations, we're limited more by the fact that it's hard to look systematically at databases of of these samples, um, because there's a lot of data that's been published in the last 15 years, but it's very difficult to actually um, interrogate that in bulk. Um, and I think that's a limiting factor right now. Um, and then the last thing, 
that I'm going to show is linking this back to flow in the mantle. So this uh, last thing, OK, so how do we take these observations and relate them back to flow and anisotropy in subduction zones? Um, and my reading of the literature on shear wave splitting and how to interpret these different signals in the end is that mantle flow is complex in 3D. And so if you want to try to relate um, the, the seismic anisotropy observations to a mantle flow model, what you need to put in there is a model. Right, so, here, so here's just an example, again, from Torsten's work of um, showing a complex flow field around a subducting slab. But if you want to understand how that relates to the splitting, you need to have a model that, incorpor that incorporates all of the textural evolution. Um, and this is something that's been looked at mainly in the ridge setting because it's actually been um, hard to just benchmark a model that works for the simple, the simple scenario of corner flow beneath a mid-ocean ridge. So this is a corner flow model. This is now we're back in a ridge setting. This is upwelling beneath the ridge and then moving along off axis. And this is a really nice study from 2009 by Castle now et al. Um, where they compared a series of different models that are out there. So VPSC, this viscoplastic self-consistent model has been very popular in the literature. There's also um, G-Rex, which is another commonly used model, and they varied some of the parameters. And they show that basically you can get a range of different predictions in terms of the orientation of, this is only showing the olivine A-axis. And so they, in comparing these models, they show differences in the prediction of the olivine A-axis orientation and also the magnitude of that fabric. Um, and so I'm just going to end by saying that um, I think it would be good to see some of this also applied in a subduction zone setting. Um, it, uh, it's obviously, you know, there's uncertainty just with the corner flow model, so it, it gets kind of worse if you're going to put this in a more complex flow field. But I will just put a plug for some work um, led by Lars Hansen, which was taking um, a set of experiments. So this is the top video is the LPO evolution as a function of strain in experiments. And then this is a model that we developed. Um, that also shows the um, development of that LPO in the model. And that model is designed um, to be incorporated into geodynamic models. Um, and so there is the potential out there to take a model like this and try to couple that into um, a subduction zone model um, and try to uh, predict, um, to try to match some of the seismic observations to the flow that we would see based on um, olivine fabrics. And um, I will leave it at that, uh, which is to say, um, you know, I, I think there's an agreement that the shear wave splitting that we see is due to olivine alignment during mantle flow. That bit's not uncertain. Um, but we see that a range of slip systems are activated in olivine. Um, and we know that things like pressure, melt, temperature, water play a role. But we don't have that really well mapped out at the moment. Um, and that, you know, looking at, in aggregate at the um, seismic observations for subduction zones and also some of the modeling, that is a, a complex flow field. But ideally, by taking these micromechanical models, we might um, be able to at least get a better fit between the seismic observations and what we understand about the flow field. OK, thank you. Questions from students and postdocs. Not all at once, please. Do people make deformation mechanism maps for the different slip systems, just for all of you? Um, so, so when okay, so when um, it does, so it's not a direct correlation like that. So when olivine is deforming, so you, we say okay, it's deforming by um, this slip system. In fact, you have to have multiple slip systems active to accommodate the deformation because you can't open up voids in the rock. So you, the requirement is that you have five independent slip systems that are active. Um, and so what we're actually saying is that the easy slip system is dominating. Um, or, or sorry, the, for example, the 100 in the, on the 010 plane is dominating relative to the other ones. But there are other slip systems active. And um, so you're not doing a direct map. You can, so you can plot up the strength of the different slip systems. because So there have been um, measurements made on single crystals where they've activated a specific slip system. And that's how, actually how we know like the easy slip system is the, is the easiest one to activate in pressure temperature space. 
but in terms of plotting up an individual flow law, it doesn't, um, I mean, you could take that single crystal data, but in the end, the aggregate, the aggregate actually has a very different strength to looking at a single crystal because multiple slip systems are active. Um, and because of the way also in the dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding, that um, grain boundary sliding component is really important. That, and that's functioning as one of your independent mechanisms. And so you also would need to um, have that flow law. So deconvolving those things is really complicated. So um, going back to that Miyabashi paper, yeah. uh, so those are, you said most of them are dredge or submersible recovered samples for the prototypes? For the trench prototypes. The trench prototypes. Okay, so in a lot of these locations, it's oceanic, oceanic subduction. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting prototype, it's not necessarily coming from really deep in the mantle wedge where the pressures would be higher. Does that matter much? Like what, at what depth would you start expecting to see B-type fabrics based on that hypothesis? Um, yeah, so it, it's a limitation of all of those trench samples that they are, that basically, you know, the, the deepest trench is whatever, nine, 10 kilometers. So that's kind of, you're still kind of well within the lithospheric, the very shallow lithospheric portion of the plate. And so, um, but the assumption um, is that that fabric that it has is kind of being frozen in from when it was at a higher temperature. Um, so it's kind of at the moment, it's like the best samples that we have available, but this is the limitation with the mantle samples is that we don't have the ability to say, oh, I would like to get the sample that is from you know, 50 kilometers depth because that's really where I expect to see this fabric develop. We really only have kind of what's exposed in the trench or what comes up in the arc volcanoes and those, those might be way too far back from the nose of the wedge to be sampling in the right area. So, so would you predict for the shallower parts to have an A-type fabric or what? I guess as you go down in depth, is it all supposed to be B-type fabric? Um, I mean, according to the to the modeling that, that Peter Van Kecken's group has done, they, they kind of say that whole nose should be. But um, I, I guess it also depends on what you, if you say that's really only happening in the asthenospheric portion or if that, that extends into the lithospheric portion. I mean, yeah, I think, I think it's just, um, it, we've struggled with, um, with the Tonga samples to really assign the kind of recent geodynamic history, right? You know, the one thing we know is that they're from like eight kilometers depth in the trench, but to to assign what path they follow to get there is is difficult. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I mean, most of those are spinel peridotites, right? So, meaning that they come from a certain pressure range where spinel is stable, so that. Uh, but so it's, except that, right, so the, the classic idea is that the shallowest part of the mantle, plagioclase, is the stable aluminous phase, and then at a 30 kilometer depth, you transition to spinel being the stable phase, and then eventually garnet. But it, that's actually incorrect in that spinel is stable almost all the way to the surface because those experiments that say the transitions at 30 kilometer were based on the chrome-free system. And once you put chrome in spinel, and these are all chrome spinels, and you extend the sp stability field. So all you can say for the ridge and the trench samples, they are always spinel prototypes. So they're not, you never have garnet field stuff. But the shallower, you never, you never see the transition to plagioclase field. You only see it when you have melt addition. Students and postdocs. <laughs> patience, <laughs> patience. <laughs> Uli was a follow up on a question that was relevant. So. No, 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 that's appropriate. It's... Well, we can, we can open it up. Uh, Christy had a comment first, and then we can go over there. 
I uh, just I was just commenting or uh, continuing the spinel to plagiarism yeah. place transition conversation. We've looked at experiments to look at that transition too, and there's other compositional variables besides the chromium that affects the spinel to plagiarism transition. And it's actually you know it's a fairly large gradient depending on the compositional variability of the host peridotite. About besides, there's some other factors like. Um, the sort of magnesium content and things like that that vary with the width of the overlap between the two of them but mm -hmm. that's not i don't think that changes the main points that you guys are talking about uh, maybe you have already tried to answer my question uh, but at the beginning you showed that the anisotropy seismic anisotropy mm -hmm. suggests is mostly b type a fabric, and then at the end, uh, you showed all the pyridotite that has been recovered, mm -hmm. has been studied, does not show that B type. Yeah. Does that mean that the seismic anisotropy has not yet been explained? I would say it is not explained. It has not been explained. Oh, that B type does not function as an explanation, because all the evidence we have suggests that um, that. We, it, it does not seem that when the B-type regime, or also that it's only in a very small portion of the wedge that you access that. But Torsten looks like he was going to make a comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I like, <laughs> on this. If Torsten has a comment related, he can go. I think it's important to realize that we're talking about subduction zone anisotropy here for the most part. Yeah. And if you look outside subduction zones, such as underneath large plates like the Pacific plate, the azimuthal anisotropy does seem to align with flow in the way that you would expect from A-type fabrics. So it's nice to see that the xenoliths also look a lot like A-type fabrics because otherwise this match and this nice consistent uh, explanation would just be a coincidence. And so now, just, yeah. just to emphasize that, so we have an understanding of LPO and isotopy that's consistent. It just happens that some subduction zones show these anomalous signals, and perhaps B is not the explanation for that. Yes, I agree with everything you said. Rather, it could be complex flow, which is what you know, was maybe perhaps the first suggestion, you know, going back to stuff that Chad Hall did in 2000, where they modeled A-type fabrics and strong along, along arc flow for Tonga, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was good, because my question's related. Um, so for the bulk of the upper mantle, um, do we think that's A-type fabric or a different type of olivine fabric? Because that's for a dry, olivine, right? So most of the dredge samples seem to be showing A-type. Is that because of some surface bias? Or I don't know if you have any I, I th No, I think, it, I think the, the majority of observations we have do show an A-type fabric. And so as Torsten just said, you know, and that, ag that agrees, you know, A-type fabric and the direction of the anisotropy being aligned with the plate motion, that all seems to agree. So in general, that does seem to be an A-type fabric. It is because of the databases of these fabrics, um, the, the Katsu's one and also one that David Mainprice has, but the actual databases are not published. It's, it's hard to tell you percentages for that and um, subdivide it further by location. Um, I mean, like for ridge prototypes, there's only one study of which Uli is a co-author that's really looked at the fabric in um, abyssal prototypes that are directly from the ridge. But, um, I think in general it is a type, uh, and but there are ways in which you can activate different subsystems. And then you asked something else. Remind me, the, you said something at the end of your question. That well, that kind of answers my question. But um, I'm, good, I'm just thinking because a type olivine is predicted to occur at low water contents. Oh, so if the the bulk of the upper mantle is indeed. A type does that have implications? It, for it's water also and not clear. Okay, so this is the the thing that I slip, skipped over, which is observations from um, the Josephine prototype, where we've measured the water content and we've measured the LPO. So many times, a lot of the studies that assign water contents based they base it on the LPO. So that there's been a lot of measurements of LPO and then an assumption of what the water type is based on the fabric diagram. And the point of this slide is just to say these are the water contents. And this fabric type, 
is this wet E-type fabric, but it has low water. And so okay. we do not find a correlation between the water content and the LPO. So, which is, um, right, so this, we're, we're actually way down at very low stress for everything. We have a mixture of A and E type, but we're like in this regime. Um, but it's not clear once you start really measuring the water content directly in your samples instead of assuming it, that how well this whole diagram plays out. Um, and I think Whitney Bear and one of her students um, also have, have similar observations as well. Um, that there doesn't seem to be a direct mapping in field yeah. samples uh, with the water okay. content. Thanks. Okay, so just I've got sort of three three things to point out. One is that kind of somewhat following up on Thorsten's comment is that, and this might be for students and postdocs thinking of projects, is that there does seem to be this correlation in, in the interior of the plates, particularly oceanic plates, where you have this uh, she always splitting the fast polarization direction, tracking that mantle flow direction and surface plate motion. And then in subduction zones, as we saw today, and um, and previously, you know, you have this this non-parallel orientation of that fast polarization direction observed from the shear wave splitting and the trench motion. And so there seems to be this zone around the subduction zones with which you transition from you know more complex shear wave splitting observations to more aligned. So something to think about is like what's controlling that transition of sort of normal or expected splitting to sort of the slab-driven mantle deformation zone. I'll sort of I don't, one thing, and then the other thing is I just want to point out for the folks interested in that, I, I will be here for the next two weeks, and I'll add some additional uh, references to the sort of 3D, 4D uh, qu uh, project options. And then thirdly, um, myself, Manuela Vincenda, and Li Jean Liu and Maureen Long are actually hosting a, a session on this at AGU this year in, in, through DI. So for the people working on that, just wanted to sort of plug that session. Um, two more uh, questions, one by Thorsten, but before that, or three more questions, one by Thorsten, one by Jim, and then first by me. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's useful to actually show the actual uh, observations of anisotropy rather than compilations from uh, papers, although it's convenient to, to, to do that. Um, the shear wave splitting in Japan in the arc and back arc is remarkably in agreement with standard two-dimensional corner flow. Uh, because the splitting is perpendicular to the trench in those regions. Mm -hmm. It's robust, uh, and this is both for local events as well as teleseismic, so it's a clear wedge signal. So if you want to go to one place in the world where a subduction zone behaves almost normal, it's in the arc and back arc of Japan. The story is entirely different for the fore arc in that same region, where you all of a sudden, right where the heat flow is low, uh, you go to trench so parallel splitting. It's a very dramatic change that occurs right where we think the four-hour corner is. Would you, based on your discussion, suggest that the flow in the four arc is trench parallel and that it's normal in the arc and back arc? Um, but from what you're saying, you're saying because you think in that situation that you are basically in a type B fabric there? Well, it's, 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 it's more easily explained by tabby fabric than by flow, I think. I mean, so I think, it, I think it's possible in that case, if it's really just in, in that four arc region, it's, right, I mean, the limiting thing is how do you test that, right? So the ideal way would be to have samples from there. Um, and then the other way is that I think we do need more lab experiments and better constrained field observations of what the conditions are when you access these different um, slip systems in olivine, right? So one of, the, one of the arguments has always been that these boundaries are very poorly constrained. And you go back to the original Carter and Ave Lalmont data, and there's a temperature effect, there's a pressure effect. And there's been more recent stuff looking at that pressure effect. So I, I think you know, it's a viable hypothesis there, but it's also, you know, when we try to make measurements where we independently measure water and fabric, it doesn't agree with this picture. Um, and so I, I don't, I think this picture is an oversimplification of how you activate the different slip systems. The other thing I would just quickly comment I, 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 there. Yeah. Oh, you're so eager. <laughs> that, that we're not, we're, with shear wave splitting, we're, I mean, with anisotropy, we're not actually measuring flow. I mean, you're looking at a shear deformation. Yes. And so it's possible that the four arc is not really flowing, but because it's so cold, but it's having a deformation fabric. 
that would be a result of a compressional deformation with a long strike extension. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Uh, a hint for those of you using the microphone. If you're at the same time trying to demonstrate fabric, <laughs> your microphone does not work. Uh, Thorsten, Lara, lunch. Yeah, uh, t two quick comments, and I think there are, there are places, as Peter said, where the splitting looks quite normal on, on, on a range of scales. And for instance, North and South America, Colombia is another place where if we had not known about the parallel alignment, we would have invoked the parallel part as the anomalous part due to flow, and the rest looks just like Mackenzie suggested in the 70s. And so I think it's going to be very interesting, as, as Margaret said, and as we've sort of come back to, to revisit this idea, and as you said in your talk, of exploring how much three-dimensional flow, and as, um, you know, as Doug just said, complexities in the flow can explain the patterns. Yeah. Um, and then the other comment is that it's not just the azimuthal anisotopy. It is also radial anisotopy, which has a one-dimensional average in the Earth that provides a constraint for what is happening. And so particularly, if you fold in the dominance of dislocation creep in certain depth regions, plus whatever fabric you think happens is being generated, and it's depth dependence, then that needs to match the radial anisotopy that we observe, which is nice, right? Because it gives you another constraint. Yes. But then yeah. my, my question is, sort of assuming that we can do this 3D flow stuff and we'll still be left with anomalous regions and subduction zones, what do you think about some of the other mechanisms that have been suggested to explain the trench pile of fabrics, such as crustal, like weird minerals in the crust that have a signature that might explain it, and there's a bunch of other explanations. So do you have a favorite alternative, assuming 3D flow, if properly modeled, doesn't cover it all? I, so I, I do not have a, a favorite alternative. I, I will say the, the one thing I um, completely avoided talking about in this talk is, is the role of melt. And there's, I actually, in the LPO figures, cut out the one that, um, the LPO that seems to be most influenced by melt. And that is, that is definitely a candidate um, for, for influencing what's going on. And in an arc setting, you expect a lot of melt to be around. And the experiments and also direct observations of field samples show this different LPO when melt seems to be present. Um, so I, I think that that would be a candidate to include in models. And I, I just think we don't have a good I, I think we don't have a good handle on how water changes the LPO. So if you want to say in a subduction zone setting, water is added, which it obviously is, it, it's just um, the exact way in which um, the different subsystems you're activated, activating in that process, I don't think we have a good constraint on. Um, and I, I think that, and that, there are other things, right? So like, you know, viscous anisotropy, the inherited fabrics, what role that's playing, um, that that could be another thing that that might matter, right? So, if the complex flow doesn't do it, maybe it's the past history of flow that is also playing a role. Um, and and then you know it's just not clear like what combination of slip systems we're getting as we add water. And you know what we've seen in the Josephine prototype is really small scale variation in the LPO. Does that matter at a bulk scale? We don't have a good constraint on that right now. So you know you could also be averaging multiple things. But the first point you made about looking at other things like radial, radial anisotropy is also really important because that does give you another constraint that narrowed, narrows down what is and is not viable. And I'm guessing Jim's going to follow along well, with that. I mean, yeah, I think this is, I think this, the, the pointing out the complexities, I think is a really important thing because, and I think it's pretty clear that seismic anisotropy, the observations of seismic anisotropy are super rich in terms of when you get down to really look in detail, there's a huge amount of variability that we don't, we can't explain very easily with simple models. And part of that I think is because it's very much an integrated effect of lots of different length scales of, of deformation that's happening. You have old deformation through the lithosphere that's yeah. encapsulated there, and then you have the present day deformation, and that's going to change very change spatially. And it's, I think, uh, become increasingly clear that even in really simple regimes like the middle of the Pacific plate, you do actually have flow regimes that are deviating from what our simple models might have suggested. And so yeah. continuing to really probe the seismic data, in particular, I think it's really a ripe time to try to go back to some of the subduction zone work and really see whether we can 
reproduce kind of what they've done in Japan and other places to try to to try to look in, in a bit more detail to better understand this problem. Yeah. I actually had a question though that goes way back to the beginning <laughs> of your talk. Okay. Which is you mentioned that for the deformation mechanism or sorry the uh, for the fabric problem mm -hmm. dislocation creep versus dislocation sorry, accommodated green, green boundary, boundary sliding. sliding basically doesn't it, they're equivalent is that true in terms of actually the say the strength of the fabric and how that might map back to the amount of strain that went into it are they both equivalently efficient I guess is what I I wanted to ask or or is there actually a subtle difference there that that I think we don't know um, be good to have Phil in the room because I think there's one line of thinking that would say that a lot of the rock deformation experiments have all have been in um, have had a large component of dislocation accommodated green boundary sliding, and so I don't know how um, many how many experiments you can assign to dislocation creep, which is what you need to really compare the two. Um, and I, I think that I think that probably there's not enough data available to assess that. Okay, Lara, last. Um, this may be a, a tough question to drop last, but uh, what about hydrous phases? Um, you know, we've been listening, thinking about this trench parallel signature, and I know that for a while anyway, people were thinking that maybe these very strongly anisotropic sheet silicates like talc or antigrite, if oriented on a dipping slab, could produce a trench parallel fast direction, either parallel to the dip of the tip of the slab if it's like a layer, or within the within the outer rise. Faults. Do you have any any thoughts on what uh, I think the latest thinking that you, is on that? That those are not um, in the right location for where you're seeing um, the the shear wife splitting. Uh, that that you're not but that you're not going to get the right the the stability field for those things is not that deep. So you, that you might and also you need to get a relatively large amount of it, right? So the only sheet silicate you have available in the mantle is phlogopite to do this, and so. Well, but so, okay, maybe I'm totally wrong, and maybe a mineral physicist can jump in and tell me, but talc and antigrite are, are very strongly anisotropic, right? And so the, there, there were a series of papers that sort of suggested that you could, in fact, have those, a layer of that, sort of above the plate, parallel to the plate. But my understanding is that the, the splitting is, is occurring over a much larger bulk volume um, than just that layer parallel to the plate, that you need it over a bulk area in the mantle.